Francis is the first pope from the Americas. The first of his name, and more than any other pope in recent memory, has dedicated his life and ministry to the poor, the peripheral, and the forgotten. Buonasera. As a leader of the Catholic Church, it is expected that the Pope upholds traditional church doctrine. But with Pope Francis, the case is different, as instead, he has been challenging and reforming these beliefs, an act that has earned him more hate, direct attacks, opposition and backlash from the leadership of the church. Protecting a Pope who wants to be accessible to the public is never an easy task. Unlike other world leaders who are very conscious of their threat, the Pope feels that it's part of his mission to be a man of the people, especially this Pope. Pope Francis, as we all know, is undoubtedly one of the most controversial popes in history who isn't scared of shaking things up in the church. His Holiness Pope Francis of the Vatican, the first pope in history to travel to Bahrain. His attempt and approach towards the church reformation have been so outlandish that, at some point, his beliefs were questioned and he was heavily accused of being heretic. Newsflash, he's at it again, as in a recent event, he was found making some really terrifying revelations about Jesus and the Bible. What did he say, and why is it raising this much dust in the Christian community? Let's find out. Pope Francis and the controversies surrounding him. On May 21, 2018, Juan Carlos Cruz, a courageous whistleblower who was a victim of Chile's shocking clergy sex abuse scandal, had the chance to meet with Pope Francis himself at the Vatican. This is a big story. A whistleblower in Chile's clerical sexual abuse scandal, which was huge, covered up, and disgusting. During their private conversations, Cruz openly shared with the Pope about his homosexuality. He went further to tell the Holy Father how the bishops back home in Chile had shamefully tried to use his sexual orientation against him in a cruel attempt to discredit his testimony. An act that took a heavy toll causing him immense pain. But guess what Pope Francis's response to him was? Juan Carlos, that you are gay does not matter. God made you like this and loves you like this and I don't care. The Pope loves you like this. You have to be happy with who you are. They had painted me in such a perverse that I was just this per And I said, Holy Father, I'm not a saint, but I certainly want to be a good person. And he said, Juan Carlos, God made you like this. God loves you like this. The Pope loves you like this, and you should love yourself. In yet another remarkable instance, the Pope sent a letter of appreciation to an American nun who has dedicated the past 50 years of her life to ministering to LGBTQ Catholics, and who over 20 years ago was investigated and threatened with being barred from her sacred work for standing up for the LGBTQ community. Are you surprised he did this? Well, you're not the only one who feels this way. Many people, especially the leadership of the Catholic Church, were shocked to their core and left dumbfounded when they heard the report so much that the Vatican refused to give an official statement either to debunk, affirm, or address the statement. But guess what? This is not the first time he's made controversial statements that have shaken the church leadership. But his recent revelation about Jesus and the Bible was so terrifying. However, before revealing what he said, Let's give a little backstory about the Pope and his controversiality. While the Catholic Church has had some really notoriously controversial popes in the past, such as Pope Alexander VI, who flouted his sacred vows by taking multiple mistresses and fathering many children, Pope Stephen VI, who went as far as to exhume the corpse of his predecessor, put the dead man on trial, and then have his body mutilated and dumped into the Tiber River. Pope Leo the Hex, whose lavish spending on Renaissance artworks caused great outrage. Pope John XIV, whose adultery transformed the papal palace into a brothel. Pope Sergius III, who purportedly had a rival candidate for the papacy assassinated to secure his election. And Pope Benedict VI, known for his violent tendencies. The controversy and backlash faced by these earlier pontiffs are nothing compared to those Pope Francis in the relatively short time since he ascended to the throne and the reasons for that are pretty obvious. Starting from his appointment, everything about him, 
and how he came to power, deviated from the norms of the Catholic Church. Before he came into power, the Catholic Church only gave appointments to candidates who were strictly from Europe. But after the resignation of his predecessor, Pope Benedict, the papacy gathered, and for the first time, they picked someone from North America. As if this deviation wasn't enough, they chose someone from a conservative group called the Jesuits. For clarity, the Jesuits are a group of Catholics who are part of a religious order called the Society of Jesus. They were founded a long time ago, in the 16th century, by a man named Saint Ignatius of Loyola. They are known for being very dedicated to education, missionary work, and deep thinking about religious and philosophical ideas. For a long time, the Jesuits were not considered for any leadership position in the Catholic Church, especially that of the Pope. This was because some other Catholic leaders and groups were suspicious of the Jesuits. They worried the Jesuits might try to gain too much power and influence over the Pope and the whole Church. Some people also thought the Jesuits were too focused on academics and book learning, instead of focusing enough on the Church's everyday practical work. Other Catholic groups, like the Franciscans and Dominicans, also didn't want the Jesuits to have too much control. They wanted to ensure the Church's power and influence was spread out, not all going to the Jesuits. But then, in 2013, all of that changed. For the very first time, to the astonishment of Catholics, Francis was chosen to be the Pope. This was really surprising because it broke from the long tradition of not picking Jesuits for this important job. What happened? Well, over time, the Jesuits had become more accepted and respected within the Catholic Church. The group of cardinals who chose the Pope felt that Francis's own personal qualities and leadership style were exactly what the Church needed at that time. So they were willing to look past the old concerns about the Jesuits and chose one of them to be the Pope. But less than a year after his appointment, they started to question their decisions because yes, he did turn things over, but not in the way they wanted it. When Pope Francis took office, he really shook things up both in the Catholic Church and the world government. He started challenging and going against some of the core traditional beliefs that the Church had held for a very long time. One of the first things he went after that riled up the Church the most was his controversial teachings about how the Church should be, particularly focusing on the Church's focus on personal morality and strict theological rules. He criticized the economic systems that allow so much inequality to exist and said the Church needed to care more for the poor and fight for the marginalized people in society. He wanted the Church to be more focused on real-world social justice issues instead of just telling people how to live their personal lives. Not stopping there, his next point of interest was with issues that were bothering the environment. Previous popes hadn't really cared about things like climate change and protecting the planet, but when Francis came in, he issued a significant document calling on the church to be a leader in environmental stewardship, saying that the church had a responsibility to speak up and take action on these critical issues. To the dismay of the church leadership, he also worked to decentralize power and authority within the church. Instead of everything being tightly controlled from the top, he gave more autonomy and decision-making power to local bishops around the world, creating a big change from the very hierarchical and centralized way the church had operated for a long time. It was a significant shift that surprised many people in the church. Increasing the tension, in a speech he gave during Christmas in 2014, he said some really important things that went against how the church had traditionally operated. One of the problems he tackled was something called clericalism. Clericalism is when the priests and other clergy in the church start to think they are more important and powerful than everyone else. Displeased, Pope Francis said this is like a disease, like leprosy, that is really hurting the church. Then, he went on telling the church leaders, especially those working in the Vatican, to get rid of the 14 bad habits and temptations, like feeling indispensable, wanting to be rich, living a double life, and even forgetting about God. His reason for saying this was born out of his desire to see a massive change in the church, as he wanted her to be more focused on serving the people instead of the leader's power and wealth. Doubling down on that, he dropped a bombshell when he said he saw the church like an upside-down pyramid, with the regular members, the regular people, as the most important, 
and the Pope and bishops as the less important, as he wanted the church to be a place where everyone works together, not just the leaders telling everyone what to do. In another instance that bewildered the church leaders, he asked that priests give communion to women who had previously had abortions. Then, the most shocking was when he said trying to convert everyone to Catholicism wasn't right, that there is nothing like a particular Catholic God, but that there's only one true God, a sermon that went against Catholics' age-long idea that they are the one and only true religion. This statement, in particular, got the church leadership so riled up that some even had to make public statements. But that's not all. A while back, whispers started circulating about a bold claim made by Pope Francis. According to reports from Eugenio Scalfari, an atheist who just so happens to be a friend of the Pope from an interview the Pope had granted to the Italian newspaper, La Repubblica, Pope Francis had said that one day, humanity might just vanish and replace new beings. Upon release, the statement sparked wide controversy and confusion. Then, sometime later, Scalfari revisited the topic, reminded that though he had spoken about the eventual end of the human species, an act which will be followed by God creating creatures to take our place, but he never addressed what would become of the souls of sinful individuals, who are destined to suffer for eternity in hellfire. In response, the Pope allegedly stated that those who repent and seek forgiveness from God would not face any punishment at all. Instead, they would be granted pardon and welcomed into the heavenly fold. But for those unwilling or unable to repent, the Pope believed they would simply cease to exist, as in his view, there is no actual hell, only the complete disappearance of unrepentant souls. When this statement was released, the Vatican quickly refuted the accuracy of Scalfari's account, insisting that the Pope's words had been poorly transcribed and should not be taken as his verbatim beliefs. But that's not all he did to shake up the Catholic Church's long-standing beliefs. Let's dig deeper to see how he stepped on the toes of the powers that be in the Church. In another press release, this same Scalfari said the Pope bluntly told him that Jesus of Nazareth wasn't God at all, and not a man. The church was willing to overlook the Pope's controversial statements and his reforms, but when he released a letter titled Amoris Laetitia in 2016, they felt they had had enough. That was when hell broke loose. This document, which was read in a gathering of bishops, tackled a topic that's always been a bit tricky, the role of the church in supporting families, especially those that might not fit the traditional mold. In a footnote, number 351 in the eighth chapter of the document, Pope Francis acknowledged that in some instances, people living in irregular situations, such as those who are divorced and remarried, may still be living in God's grace and could potentially be granted access to the sacraments, including the Eucharist. Now, you might think, what's the big deal? Shouldn't the church just be there for everyone? Well, the Catholic Church has long had very strict rules about who can and can't receive certain sacraments, like communion, and the Pope, in his wisdom, suggested that perhaps those rules could be a bit more flexible, especially when it comes to divorced and remarried couples. This move was seen by some as a significant departure from the Church's traditional stance, which had strictly prohibited communion for those in irregular marital situations. The Pope's argument was rooted in a nuanced understanding of the human condition. He acknowledged that not every situation is black and white, and that pastors must approach these cases with empathy, discernment, and a desire to help people grow in God's grace, rather than simply applying rigid moral laws. Before we would know it, the Pope's words were being picked apart, analyzed, and scrutinized like never before. Four highly placed leaders even sent him a letter asking him to back up his stance with a more substantial reason or source, but he left the letter unanswered, and that was when they took their concerns public, turning the debate into a bitter, protracted struggle. Until then, even his supporters had been willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, viewing him as essentially a kindred spirit, if a bit unorthodox. But Amoris Laetitia shattered that illusion, and at this moment, it became a matter of gone were the days when they could simply claim Francis as one of their own. At this point, the battle lines were drawn, 
with the Pope firmly on the side of a more merciful, nuanced approach to complex moral issues, and his critics feeling that he betrayed the Catholic faith. Things escalated to the point where a group of well-known Catholic figures, including scholars and theologians, wrote a petition accusing the Pope of heresy, a term for a grave violation of church doctrine. They even went as far as calling on bishops to formally admonish the Pope and even remove him from office if he did not repent. Upon releasing the letter, within just 12 hours of its release, over 1,500 more people had signed supporting their claims against the Pope. This was the most challenging time for the Pope, but being a man with a thick skin, he continued his routine until his recent unsettling revelation about Jesus and the Bible. Did he drop another controversial bombshell as usual in his character? You wouldn't want to miss this part, so let's find out. Pope Francis's Terrifying Truth About Jesus and the Bible In an address he sent to the Pontifical Biblical Commission that left them dumbfounded on a meeting they held from May 2nd, 6 to talk about the biblical truths and inspiration, the Pope said we couldn't just see the Bible as the Word of God in a very strict, literal way. Instead, we need to look at the Bible as a complete book where all the different parts connect to and inform each other. The Pope said we can't just take one sentence or phrase from the Bible and say, this is absolutely true and literally correct. Instead, we have to look at the bigger picture and the overall message and meaning that the Bible is trying to convey. According to him, when you look at it that way, the whole thing starts to make more sense, and you can really understand the meaning behind it. The Pope criticized two different ways people sometimes look at the Bible. On one side, he said some people just treat the Bible like any old book without realizing how special and important it is. On the other hand, he said some people think every single word was directly given to us by God, and that everything in the Bible is literally true, which is how the Catholic Church interprets the Bible. The Pope didn't agree with either of those views. Instead, we have to understand that the Bible was written by human authors in particular historical and cultural contexts. So if we must grasp the true meaning and significance of God's Word in the Bible, we have to interpret it in a more thoughtful, nuanced way, looking at the whole, rather than just taking little bits of it and using them however we want. That was not all. In another recent sermon portrayed Jesus as a humble person, who was deeply familiar with the harsh struggles that regular people faced back then. Using this perspective of Jesus, Francis encouraged Christians to follow his example by reaching out and helping the people around them, especially those with a hard time. Not only is he a controversial person, but he is one person who also walked the talk, so he seizes every opportunity to practice what he preached. One striking example occurred when the Pope visited a prison. Even though he had just recovered from an illness, the Pope went straight to lead a mass and wash the feet of 12 young inmates. These inmates came from all different backgrounds, diverse nationalities, races, and even religions like Islam. As the Pope performed this symbolic foot-washing ritual, he gave an important sermon explaining that foot-washing was not just an old tradition, but a way of showing how people should care for one another. Going further, he plainly stated that seeing so much injustice in the world was terrible, with people taking advantage of others and many trapped without any way out. The Pope said that if anyone had avoided such hardship, it was not because they were better, but because of God's grace. While still there, he told them something profound, that every single one of us can slip up, that we are all sinners, but that the awareness that we can all make mistakes is what gives us our dignity. He added that Jesus wants us this way, which is why he wanted to wash the feet of his disciples to save and serve them. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right, let's keep rolling. To back this up, the Pope quoted Jesus, saying that our lives will be wonderful if we listen to his lessons. That's because we would rush to help each other instead of taking advantage like selfish people do. The Pope preached that helping others and lending a hand comes from a noble heart. This is what Jesus wants to teach us today. 
He further added that we may have done so much evil that we might think he, the Pope, would condemn us if only he knew the filthy things we did. But that shouldn't scare us because Jesus knows everything about us already. He is not afraid of our weaknesses and loves us just as we are as he had already paid for your sins. And we only need to allow him to walk beside us and take our hand so that life will not be too hard for us. In essence, the Pope was saying that Jesus doesn't judge us for our failures. He simply wants to accompany us, ease our burdens, and love us unconditionally, even in our imperfect state. Whether you're religious or not, these, without a doubt, were truly uplifting and inclusive teachings about embracing our shared flaws while striving for goodness. As if that wasn't enough, later, at a Mass in St. Peter's Square, the Pope reiterated and expanded upon this message, preaching that Christians must pray for the ability to look at others with the same boundless mercy and caring that Jesus shows us. The Pope plainly stated that no one is perfect. We all sin and make mistakes. He said that no one could be saved if the Lord judged solely on our weaknesses. To lay credence to his sermon, he referenced the Gospel of John, showing how God sent his Son not to condemn the world, but to save it. In that light, he explained how Jesus, in his encounters with people in the Gospels, saw their entire authentic selves, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As he put it, there were no secrets before Jesus because he read their hearts. However, the crucial point the Pope emphasized was that Jesus was not looking to shame or harshly judge. Instead, he saw the whole person, not to point fingers, but to embrace our lives, free us from sin, and save us. Jesus, the Pope said, has no interest in putting us on trial or condemning us. Instead, he simply wants none of us to be lost. The Pope then described the Lord's view of us as a gentle, friendly lamp that allows us to see the good in ourselves while still recognizing our flaws so that we can grow with his grace. However, the Pope then admitted that we often fail to treat each other with that same compassionate, merciful lens. Instead, we frequently condemn others, speaking badly and gossiping against them. He rounded up by saying being a Christian goes beyond just going to church. It is mostly about living out the values of the gospel in our daily lives and showing kindness and solidarity with those in need through charity, service, and advocacy. After this, he asked that God give us this merciful gaze so that we could look at others as he looked at us. What do you think the church cardinals were right by accusing him of heresy? What do you think of his approach towards Christianity and the Bible? We'll be waiting to hear from you in the comments. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. See you soon. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.